Okie dokie. Let's go. I don't know if I mentioned this in the past, but I will mention it now. We only cover three topics in this class. This is the first one, limits. Then we'll do derivatives, then we'll do integrals, and we're done. Okay. Now it would be nice if it was that easy. Each one of those. The quickest one is by far limits. We'll spend maybe a week or two in that. Derivatives will take us up until winter break. Integrals will take us from winter break close to spring break. Then review, then review, then review, test, then parts. Okay. You. So let's talk about limits. In particular, we're going to look at a tangent problem. Uh, have you talked about limits in pre-calc? Suppose you're shaking your head yes. Could you give us a brief summary of what's a limit? No pressure, though. Oh. Um, I'm not sure. What is it like as the value approaches zero? Not horrible. Doesn't have to be zero, but that's that's the idea. We're looking at values as they approach a certain number and what happens to the function. So today we're going to, in the first one we're going to check to make sure you can calculate the slope of the line. I'm assuming that's a big old check. Yes. Good. It better be. We're going to talk about the difference between a secant line and a tangent line to a function. Our emphasis in this class is all about tangent lines. Are you okay with the phrase tangent line? Do you know what a tangent line is? Correct. Yeah. It's the function in only one point. See, if, we'll do more about this in a second, but you're correct. Okay. It's a function in one point. We're going to estimate the slope of the tangent line. That's a crucial calculation that we're going to do a lot in here. And then we're going to talk about the difference between instantaneous and average velocity on a trip to grandma's house. And then you should be able to fit at least 20 grapes in your mouth without trouble. Okay. Any questions? Just for giggles, just to make sure, since again, we're starting calculus today and I want to make sure we're all on the same page, please calculate those two slopes. Dimitri, what did you get for the uh, slope of AB? I got negative 2. Can somebody confirm? Yeah. Uh, diggity. How about the second line PQ, Puma Quail? Undefined. Undefined. What would that look like if you graphed it? All lines are straight. Could it be a parabola? No, sir. It's a line. Just on the x axis? No, sir. Certainly. Also known as? Also known as Brian was vertical. Vertical, very good. Okay. It's a vertical line. Now, why, and I think we talked about this, but I'm going to review. Why does a slope that's undefined, why is that slope generated by a vertical line? I don't know if I asked my question very well. So let's see if you can answer my watered-down, mediocre question with a solid kind of answer. Because if there is no one value for that was um, Trust me, I was there 30 seconds. We're both going to give up. Because there's an infinite number of answers on that, uh, for each x value on that line. Why? Well, it's all every for like x equals one half, all real numbers could be a slope. Okay. I mean, Other Liam, you could say it's infinity, but also how do you know it's like whether it goes up ten every zero? No, it's like undefined. 12, but yeah, that's why yeah. it's undefined, which is making sense. No, well, not quite. Any other? What's the change in y? Hmm. 
Oh, it's divided by zero, right? As well as right. Right. But, yeah. but uh, again, answer my question. What's the change in y? Infinity. No. Wait. Infinity. 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 What's the change in y? Zero. No. The change in. Looking at the line PQ, right? Calculating the slope of PQ. What's the change in Y? Negative 22. Okay. Wasn't a trick question. Right? 13 minus 9. Okay. What's the change in X? Zero. Why is a horizontal line zero? The slope of a horizontal line zero? Because the change in y is zero where there's a change in x, which does go along with what you said, that all, they all have the same x value, so there'd be no change in the y value for that, for a horizontal line, whereas there's no change in x for the vertical line. Okay. Wow, that took a lot longer than I thought for an algebra one problem. Let's move on. Here's a picture. I've got a picture of a function. That purple function, it looks like it might be a cubic. Do not assume things that you don't know. I just have a purple function. And on that purple function, I have two points, A and B. That green line represents a secant line. By definition, a secant line is a line that intersects a function in two points. Let me rephrase that. It's a line that intersects a function in at least two points. Because notice, if I backed out of that picture, zoomed out, it would hit it in another point way further down. The blue line is what's called a tangent line. By definition, a tangent line intersects a, uh, a function, sorry, in exactly one point. If I gave you some information about A and B, could you calculate the slope of the green line? The answer would be yes. It was a redundant question because I know you could all do it. If I gave you the points of A and C, you could calculate the blue line. The problem is, in the future, knowing where we're going, I'm going to ask you to find the slope of that blue line with only telling you the location of the point A. And I chose a point for A to make it pretty here so the blue line is horizontal. That won't always happen. If I chose a point somewhere out here, let's go here. Eventually, you're going to be able to tell me the slope of the tangent line at that other point, which we'll call Diaz and Donkey. Which right now, that doesn't make sense because you're used to calculating slopes given two points. Welcome to calculus. That's the gist of what we're going to do in two or three more weeks. Let me show you another picture here. Hopefully this works. No, you stop. Come on, put pen away. Come on, come on. There we go. Oh, nice. Okay. All right. All right. Stop it. Okay, preview. Bingo. All right. So here's my setup. Similar picture before. The reason I have this is because it's going to do a pretty little animation. It's cool to watch. And I want to get some notation under control. So I picked a point on the blue function and I called it P. When you started in Algebra 1, every point had the coordinate x, y. Okay, now we're in calculus, and maybe you did this last year in pre-calc, I don't remember, but now points start to have the location x, f of x. Okay, instead of x, y, we go x, f of x, or g of x, or h of x. So notice the y value of p is f of x, the x value of p is at x. Then I moved over some distance to the right. That distance is called delta x. Okay, delta meaning change, change in x, so I changed x over here to the right. So that green, uh, that's a yellow point. That yellow point is located at x, at x plus delta x. You with me? Good. And it's the same picture I had before. The red line is the tangent line, the green line is the secant line. The question is, 
What happens if I start sliding Q towards P? What's going to happen to the green line? Lines can't get shorter, they go on forever. So who was your geometry short. teacher? <laughs> that explains so much. All right. Q towards P. Q towards P. Along the along the curve. Yep. Yeah. Um, slope will change. It, the slope will change. Okay. Good. So let's. I realized when I made this, it took an exorbitantly long amount of time, but maybe this. Maybe I could have put Q closer. So, he wants to get rid of the so this is uh, yeah. Hey, how about those bears? Okay. So let's stop it there. As Q moves along that curve, other than what Lauren said about the slope of the green line, what else is changing in that picture? Okay. Yeah, it's passing through an infinite number of points from where it started to where it currently is. Good. What else is changing? Delta X. Delta X. Okay, in this case, delta x is getting smaller. And as it gets closer, delta x gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, getting very small. I think this happens pretty quick. And then, bam. So when q goes to p, a lot of stuff happens. What does delta x currently equal? Zero. Good. Notice the green line appears to have disappeared like magic. Where's the green line? Right. It's under the red line. The green line, which was a secant line, has become a tangent line. That's our ultimate goal. I'm going to show you a bunch of formulas that will get us to that and some theories, but for now I just wanted you to understand the visual of what's happening. Okay? Back to this. Move on. Okay. That is the slope, and first of all, that should look familiar. We played with that already, yes? You may have had an A and an H in there. We did some delta X there. But that's where that formula comes from. It's very important. It's called the difference quotient. If I go back to that picture and I calculated the slope of that green line, the slope of the green line would be F of X plus delta X. That's the Y value at Q minus the Y value at P over delta x, which is the change in the x. Okay. So again, that's the slope of the green line. What we're going to do in a little while is start talking about what happens if I take that value and make delta x get really small. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. We'll talk about that. And that's what's going to get us to this idea of limits. Uh, let's skip this. It's just more slope calculations. I know you can calculate slopes. Let's take trip to grandma's house. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the difference between instantaneous velocity and. Um, oh my god, I'm drawing a blank. Non instantaneous? Yeah. Um, no. Hold on. No, I average, 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 Say loud, say proud. 50 miles, per hour. 50 miles per hour. Okay. Is that an average or an instantaneous velocity? Average. It's an average. You didn't back out of your driveway doing 50 miles an hour. You didn't run through every traffic light at 50 miles an hour. You didn't blow through 7 Eleven at 50 miles an hour. Some points you were stopped at traffic lights. Sometimes you were on the highway doing 75. When everything is said and done, you've averaged 50 miles per hour. Does that make sense? 
what would be an instantaneous velocity. An instantaneous velocity would be how fast were you going at this point in time. So what's your instantaneous velocity at the start? Zero. Zero. You're in your driveway. You're in your garage. What's your instantaneous velocity when you pull into grandma's driveway? Zero. Zero. And then you've got every possibility in between. Now, let me refresh your memory mathematically. If your average is 50, that means that there's got to be some points where you went slower than 50, and there's got to be some points where you went faster than 50. You're all good with that idea, right? Okay. What we're going to talk about in, in the near future is the fact that the slope of that secant line equates to an average velocity, whereas the tangent line equates to the instantaneous velocity. This is some more calculus stuff that we'll get to eventually. And that's why I'm going through this quickly because we want to get into the calculus. This is just an introductory stuff in chapter two. Okay, so now we got grandma's house under control. Beautiful. We're done with day six. Any questions? Okay, helpful uh, tip for you there. Let that sink in. Tangent is this continuous velocity. Via, did you just say you do it in the other order? Oh, that's healthy. I see it in the textbook and I in the history that I said. Okay. And then I write it down and then I write more. I mean, there might be other steps in there. That's a, a dumbed-down version. Sometimes yeah. parade gets thrown in there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's do some calculus, shall we? Now we're going to start talking about limits. We're going to talk about what a limit is. Posey gave us a nice introduction. We're going to go a little bit more in-depth with it. We're going to get the notation under control. This causes a problem. And again, I'm going to be a stickler for notation because when you take the AP test, the reader that looks at your test, by the way, you, do you know the graders of AP tests are called readers? I don't know why they're not just graders. Maybe that has a negative connotation. But whatever. We're going to guesstimate a limit. I'm not sure how to get it, so I'm going to guess. We're going to deal with what happens when limits get to infinity. See what I did there? Buzz light here. You guys know who Buzz light here is? Okay, I just didn't know where you are in the Disney spectrum. Where are you in the Disney spectrum? Like, what was the big Disney film when you kid, when you when you kids were kids? When you were young? Like, what what Disney video was it that you watched a thousand times a day? Incredibles. Incredibles. Rapunzel. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I think there's something that I like right now. I appreciate it right now, but I don't think we're going to talk about plugging and chugging. Sorry, I should have gotten a sidetrack. Uh, and today, one of your goals should be to make a new friend. Just go up to some stranger in the hallway to introduce yourself. That won't be awkward at all. Or maybe Let's start with something very simple. Your friend and mine, Mr. Parabola x squared. And I put a big blue dot at 1, 1. Um, what I find helpful for limits, and you might think this is ridiculous, what I find helpful for limits is imagine myself walking along the function. So if I'm walking along the function and I'm approaching 1, 1, so let's say I start at 0, 0. And I start walking along the function and I get closer and closer to 1. Okay. By When I say, let me make sure you understand the terminology, when I say I'm getting closer and closer to 1, I'm referring to the x value. So as the x value of my journey gets closer to 1, what y value do I get closer to? 1. Does that seem like an obvious answer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, suppose I get closer and closer to 2. It's off the graph, but you're all fairly smart. What y value would I get closer and closer to? 4. We're good, because 2 squared is 4. Okay. Is there anything difficult about that? 
No. Now that process we just, okay, let me ask one more question. I'm really walking along the graph for a while and I get out to 10. What y value will I approach? Excellent. Again, was that difficult? Where'd the 100 come from? 10 squared. 10 squared, that's what we call plug and chug. Stick 10 into the function, spits out an answer. Okay, we're good? That's the first chunk of limits. If you can do that, you're good to go. And that, sometimes a limit problem will just be that simple. Okay. So let's get some notation under control. Here's limit notation. As it says there, that notation means what is the limit as x approaches 1 of the function x squared? In other words, what's the y value as you get very close to the x value of 1? Okay, any problems? Now notice, that doesn't say, I started the problem by saying I started 0, 0 and I'm walking up the hill. If I go back to this picture, what if I start way to the right and I come down the hill? Will the values change? No. Right? If I go from 0, 0 towards 1, I get 1. If I go from uh, 2 towards 1, I'm still going to get 1. So it doesn't matter what direction I come in. But sometimes direction will matter, so we have some different notation. Okay, now notice the only difference between the red and the blue is that little plus sign. And notice where the plus sign is. It's not plus 1, it's 1 plus. That means what's the y value of the function when I approach the x value of 1 from the right hand side, from the more positive side. And then of course if you can come from the right, you can also come from the left. In the example that I have for you, all three of those answers are exactly the same because we plugged in chug. One squared is one. Does that seem like an easy concept? Are you worried that it's going to get ugly? It's not. Go ahead. How would you write it? You would just give the numerical answer. Yeah, just one. Yeah, if I change the 1 to a 7, it would be sort of 49. Okay. Now, what helps with limits is that you remember what you're talking about. You're getting close to an x value, and the answer to the problem is the y value. A limit is always a y value getting spit out. Remember that, it'll make your life a lot easier. Okay? So let's make it a little bit more complicated. Well, Posey already answered this for us. Do we need to define this, or are we okay? Good. Okay, let's move on then. I changed the picture a little bit. Put a hole in it. Now, why is there a hole in that function? Oh, wait, let me give you the function. There's the function. This is going to be fun. Okay, so rule number one with limits always, always, always plug and chug first. By the way, don't be bashful. Bust out your calculators. You're going to need them probably. Since rule number one is plug and chug, I'm going to ask you, please plug and chug and tell me what you get for an answer. divided by zero, it's even worse. Zero over zero, that's really bad. Okay. But I will tell you, you'll have to trust me on this, 
Well, we don't have to. You could graph it yourself. That picture is a graph of that function. Okay. We're pretty close to it. So what, what do we do now? So now we've run into the first problem. The, the previous example with x squared is about as easy as a limit gets. Here's another limit problem. You told us to plug and chug. We plugged and chugged. It didn't work. What's step two? Very simple. Step two, algebraically manipulate. Does that term make sense? How about we try factoring? Okay, go. Duncan, you back to the bottom? I found it. Give it to us. 3x plus 5 and then x minus 4? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So, what happens? It cancels, right? The x minus 4s cancel. What does that look like graphically? It's a hole. How do we deal with a hole? Let's go back to this picture. I'm walking along the function. Here I come. Do, 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 do. Can I get a limit at that hole? By the way, how big is that hole? Infinitely small. Can I get really close to that hole? Yeah, how close? Infinitely close. So, I can continue to get closer and closer and closer to that hole, but I can't necessarily get to the hole because there's a hole there. So I'm not, a limit is not asking for the value of the function, it's asking for the limit as you get close to the function. Now sometimes, like x squared, they're the same thing. The value of the function is the same thing as you get closer. This is different. There's no value there to get to, but we can get really close to it. And, based on the algebra that we've done, you can tell me exactly where that hole is located, can't you? Yeah. yeah. What's the x value of that hole? Four. Four. How do we know that? Well, because conveniently enough, that's our, our x value of the limit, but also we canceled the term x minus four over x minus four, which left me to that part of the function. If the hole wasn't there, 
if the x minus 4 wasn't there, could you tell me where that hole is located? In other words, could you tell me the y value of that hole? No. Was that a yes or no? No. You can't. Because now, if I plug and chug again, what does that function represent? That function, fun did I just swear there? For this. I thought I left out the end. Um, in function. You'll get it eventually. That function represents the previous function with the hole filled in. So if I want to know the y value, I can just plug 4 into that. Do that, please. Now, let's, what, I, what I want to do is I want to make sure you understand what we're doing. I could teach you this by just saying do this, this, and this, but without understanding, you're going to have problems. <coughs> so what happened? We have a function that when we plugged and chugged, in other words, we tried to figure out what the value of the function is at the point 4, it didn't work. We have an undefined function. There's a hole there at 4. And so what I said was, okay, hold on, let's get rid of the hole. Let's cancel the x minus 4 over x minus 4 and figure out what the value of the hole would be if it were filled in. That's where the 15 17 comes in. So that tells me, as I travel along that graph and I get closer and closer and closer, I'll never get to 15 17 but I'll get as close as humanly possible. And that becomes our limit. Does that concept make sense? Beautiful. We're going to go far with this then. So to summarize, plug and chug first, number one. Number two, if plug and chug doesn't work, then you try to algebraically manipulate. Once you're done with that, plug and chug again. And hopefully you get an answer. But it might not work. So let's look at some problems that could occur that are going to cause trouble. So first of all, notation, we know that already. What is the limit as x approaches a? a is some number of a function. And when you do that, you get L. L is a common, capital L is a common notation for the y value or the limit of a function. Okay, which is what we already talked about. We looked at three pictures already, so I'll just skip that and move on to this. Um, do we have time for this? Yeah, we have time for this. Daniel, yeah. read the rules. You're enclosed in an area approximately the size of half a soccer pitch. No weapons, no kicks to the groin, the children have absolutely no fear. If the child is knocked out, they are out. Then they are out. Same for you. Okay, so the question is, how many five-year-olds could you beat up before they knocked you out? I'll call five-year-olds. How big are they? Five-year-olds? Oh, that's not true. Five-year-olds? No, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Daniel? Huh? We'll pick it on you. How many could you fight? Are they coming all at once or just one at a time? Uh, they're, uh, they're, it's a swarm. Swarm? Do they have strategy? It's, is it like one no, or zero? They're, they're rabid, they're rabid animals. They don't, they're, there's no organization. It's just, it's like a zombie infestation with five-year-olds. Okay, for the rest of you, for the rest of you in your notes, write down the number of five-year-olds you think you can beat before they overwhelm you. All right, we good? Hey, how many do you think? Four. Four? Okay, that's okay. No, no, sorry. I, didn't, I shouldn't be judgmental. Four. Excellent. So in order to test your, to calculate your number, I have to ask you some questions. Are you ready? Okay. Maeve, what's your body type? Are you obese, overweight, average, slim, or muscular? Okay. How long is your arm reach? 
under three and a quarter feet, about a meter, three and a quarter feet, or over three and a quarter feet? Um, like just straight? Yeah. yeah. Uh, probably under. How's your balance? Pretty good. Okay. Would you say excellent? Um, no, I'll go average. But you just said it was pretty good. Well, yeah, but I wouldn't say excellent. Okay. All right. How high can you kick? I can't kick. I don't know. Not very high. Average high. Not very high. Huh. Okay. How tall are you? Um, I would be somewhat average. Okay. How old are you? 17. Okay. Do you have any martial arts experience? No. None at all? None. Okay. How many fights have you been in? None. None? Okay. This is not looking good. Have you ever been trampled? <laughs> no. No? Okay, so you have no experience with that. Are you willing to fight dirty? It's, what? I, it's binary, you. yes or no. no. They don't have souls. They're trying okay. to kill you. Okay. Five yeah. Yeah. Yes, you'll fight dirty. How would you feel about fighting children? Wrong, you're neutral, you don't care, you have mixed feelings. It's wrong? Okay. Here's the big one. Would you pick up a child and use it as a weapon? Okay. Sixteen children. You <laughs> underestimated your ability. Congratulations. Okay. Yeah, I am too. That's great. Okay. Back to this. Let's move on. Okay. So, next example. Now things get funky. Rule. One, uh, sorry. Step number one. Plug and chug. Go ahead. I'll wait. Time's up. What's it equal? Y. And. Good. Okay, so let's make a distinction between just zero in the denominator for limits doesn't lock us up. We can work with that. I'll show you how to do that later. What's really bothersome is the fact that it's zero over zero. Okay, so step one failed. Step two. Algebraically manipulate. Can you do anything to that function algebraically? No, I can't either. I don't know what to do with that. If I can't algebraically manipulate it, then I can't plug and chug again, so I'm kind of screwed. What do I do? All right, bust out your Desmos or your calculator, but I would use Desmos because it's easier to see and graph the function sine of x over x. then you should be able to zoom in on x equals 0 and tell me what the value of the function is when x is equal to 0. 1. Zoom in some more. What's the value? Still 1. Zoom in some more. Yep. And you can zoom till you're blue in the face. It's going to stay 0. So by zooming in, we're representing getting closer and closer. No matter what I do, the value is always 1. But the function tells us there shouldn't be a value at that point, right? Because we got 0 over 0. How do you deal with that? Go ahead. So we start talking about infinitesimally small values. In a, in a situation like this, instead of beating a dead horse, we're just going to consider this a theorem. If you're taking the limit of this function, sine of x over x, you just have to remember that it's 1. Now, this bothers me because I'm not a big uh, fan of memorizing. But the work that it takes to show 
mathematically why the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is 1 is way too much work and too time consuming. So you're going to jot that down in your notes. You're going to put a box around it so that you remember that that's going to be equal to 1. We will run into a couple of those. I have at least two more of those that we'll get to later that you're just going to remember the theorem. Everything else we can pretty much work with. Case in point. That. Okay. Is it safe to assume you all know what that graph looks like? Yeah, in case you don't, I have a picture of it. Question number one. What if it wasn't 0? What if it's the limit as x approaches 4 of 1 over x? What's the answer? No. What is the limit as x approaches 4 of 1 over x? How much? 1 over 4. Plug and chug. Any problems? OK, beautiful. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes here. What's the answer to the limit I have on the board? Undefined. Why? Loud and proud. It's 1 over 0. OK, so Nathan is suggesting that because it's 1 over 0, it can't have a limit. Yeah. Does not exist. Interesting. Were you raising your hand or just okay? I saw it moving out of the corner. Okay. All right. So let, let me change the question then. <laughs> What's that? Closing? Positive infinity. Well done. Is everybody good with that answer? If I'm walking along the graph heading towards zero from the right hand side, I'm going to keep going up and up and up and up and up. Infinity. Excellent. Changing colors. The limit as x approaches zero from the negative of 1 over x equals negative infinity. Okay? We're good with that, yes? Okay, now here's a weird thing. Sometimes the college board, and I'll talk more about this in the future, sometimes the college board doesn't like the answer of infinity because they don't consider it a number. A lot of it depends on what mood they're in. It's the dumbest thing ever. For us, those are solid answers. So let's go back to this guy. If I got an answer for the red part and I got an answer for the blue part, can't I get an answer for the black part? No? Why not? Because that plus and the minus changes it. Excellent. Okay. The answer is we commonly use the uh, term DNE. Does not exist. And it leads us into a theorem, which must be important because it's in a purple rectangle. Okay. Oh, let me get the blue out of the way there. That's a little hard to read. Hold, please. Okay, so what does that purple rectangle say? It says that in order for a function to have a limit, okay, that's the first part. In order for there to be a function of a limit at a point A, then the left-hand limit has to match the right-hand limit. So the red one is what's called the right-hand limit, the limit coming from the right-hand side. The blue one that I erased was the left-hand limit, the limit coming from the left-hand side. If those two things aren't equal, you're done. It doesn't work. Okay, so there it is in English. We'll do that a lot. Especially when we start looking at things like asymptotes. Okay, so let's take a breather for 30 seconds. Does, is this making sense? This is the audience participation part of the program? Yes? So, 
It's all limits. So if I go back to my example with x equals as x approaches 4, I can do the same thing. If I approach x from the right hand side at 4, I'm going to get 4. If I approach it from the left hand side at 4, I'll get, uh, sorry, I'll get 1 fourth. 1 fourth equals 1 fourth, I'm good to go, the answer is 1 fourth. Okay. But we're not going to do that a lot for these very straightforward simple limits because it's a waste of time. We're usually going to use this idea when we're approaching weird parts of graphs, either piecewise functions, I have an example of one in a second. Okay, so let, let's move on and maybe this will help clarify. Okay, this guy. The blue is my function, I've got an asymptote at A. What's the limit as I approach A from the right hand side? That's what I'm saying? Positive infinity, do you all agree? It goes up and up and up. What happens if I approach from the left? Positive infinity. So what happens when I approach at A? Positive infinity, good. Whoops. Because the left-hand limit matches the right-hand limit, we're good to go. Okay? Now, the next, some of you saw the picture, the next one's going to get a little weird, so I want to make sure you're with me before we move on. Make sense? Okay. Good. Okay. Um, would the limit ever be one negative four? It could. Well, can you hold your question for one second? Let me do the next example, and then maybe that'll answer your question. Okay, so here's this weird piecewise function. Let's start with that. What's that equal to? Be bashful. 2.5. 2.5. We all good? Okay, that's an example of plug and chug. There's a value at zero, the y value is 2.5, life is grand. If I lose you along the way, please say so because this is really uh, summing up everything we've talked about today. All right, what's the limit as you approach two from the positive side? One. One, excellent, are we all good on that? You're walking along the function, coming from the right-hand side, getting closer and closer to 2. What y value am I getting closer and closer to? The answer is 1. But wait, there's no value at 1. Again, that doesn't matter. It's what we're getting close to. So the hole shouldn't scare us. Still good. Awesome. What's the limit as I approach 2 from the negative side? 3. Hot diggity. 3. Also good. Excellent. Okay, <coughs> so we won't wreck the train. What's that? Undefined. Excellent. What's the last question I'm going to ask you? It's on the slideshow. I should just stop passing out the slideshows. What's the limit as you approach five? Two? One. Oh, I'll throw another one in there. Undefined? DNE? Huh. It doesn't exist because we don't. Okay, hold on. Nathan, present your case. You're arguing does not exist yeah. because? Because when you're traveling on the line towards the five, you don't actually go over the point. Like, uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Any other arguments? It should be two because from both sides you're approaching two. But I got a point down there at uh, one. But when you, as you get closer to that point, you still are only yeah. having to yes. Yes. Oh. Interesting. Okay, let me ask a couple more questions. What's f of five? One. one. Hot diggity. What's the limit? as x approaches 5 from the positive of f of x? 2. Two. Oh, you guys are so smart. What's the limit as x approaches 5 from the negative of f of x? 2. Two. Two. Does the left-hand side match the right-hand side? Yeah. Yeah. So what Liam said is correct. What's the answer to this? 
2. This has absolutely nothing to do with the limit. We're not getting close to that point. It's just there to confuse you. Yeah, yeah. that's why I gave you that example, because I knew it would. When you get into these uh, limit problems, when they become piecewise functions like that, they, they being the textbook, they being me, they being the college board, likes to throw these kind of things at you. And the reason they throw these kind of things at you, because this tests whether or not you really understand what's going on. Okay? This was no problem. You did outstanding with these two guys coming from the left and the right. But this is where you put it all together and understand that that point has nothing to do with the limit. We're talking about getting very close to a point, and that value sitting down at 1 has nothing to do with anything. Okay. Are we good on this slide? Does that answer your question, or did it confuse you more? Don't give me that. No, I know. You're still confused. Like, would you ever get like two? For an actual limit value? No, only one answer. Yeah. Now, you can get different answers like, um, like these two. We got different answers at the same point if we approach from different directions. But no limit problem will ever give you two different answers. You can't approach two different spots. Does that make sense? I can't approach this chair while also approaching that chair at the same time. That's a bad example, but does that help? Yeah. Okay, good. Somebody else said, yeah. Two, you mean number three? Okay. That means I'm on the function, I'm walking along the function, and I'm starting over to the left-hand side of the function. I'm starting in the negative direction and heading towards the point, or I'm heading towards the point from the more negative direction. So here's me walking along the function. And as I get closer and closer, I'm going to get to that point, get really close to that point without really getting that point, hence the reason it's at three. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Any other clarifications? We're good? Excellent. Okay, go ahead. This one's all you. This will be a little review for some, uh, for some stuff. <laughs> This is more of an algebra problem than it is a calculus problem. Step one, plug and chug, what happens? Zero over zero. Step two, algebraic manipulate. Do you remember how to factor the numerator? That's the reason I thought I wanted to go over this problem. That is the difference of cubics. Yeah. You don't remember the idea. Oh, oh. Ooh. All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. If we are factoring a cubed minus b cubed, what do we get? A squared. Some, uh, it's, I forgot if it's plus, it's plus B squared, then uh, I think it's minus, oh, I it. wait. Plus B squared, and then on the other side it's A minus B squared. No, it's um, minus 2AB plus B squared, and then 
Then there's the other part of it's A minus B. Oh, 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 whoa, 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 hold on. Now you're getting somewhere. Let's clean this up. I'd have to write it out. Okay. I'll give you this to start. Yeah, and then it's going to be uh, A squared. Plus 2AB. Wait. Not 2AB. Oh, it's just AB. Just AB. It's just AB. Uh, plus B squared. Well done. Let's give it up for Nathan, huh? <laughs> Difference of perfect squares, you know that. Sum of perfect squares doesn't factor, it's prime. Difference of perfect cubes factors into this. Sum of perfect cubes also factors into whoops into this. Okay. So I'm not going to finish this problem, but now that you know how to factor perfect cubes, you factor the numerator, and you can see what's going to happen here. You're going to have an x minus one that's going to cancel. With the x minus 1 in the bottom, you generate a hole, plug and chug again, you're good to go. By the way, when you're doing this, these two expressions are prime. They don't factor. You don't have to worry about factoring them anymore. Okay. All right, so again, like I said, it's more of an algebra problem to refresh your memory on uh, factoring the sum of cubes or the uh, difference of cubes. We're done. So again, plug and chug, algebraically simplify. You may want to look at the graph at some point. You may want to guess. Uh, via, you might want to throw cry in there at like step, where would you put it in? Step four and a half? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, you think? Or step three and a half? Step zero. You want to cry earlier or later? Oh, Oh, so you'd have like step half. Yeah. Cry. Yeah. yeah. Then. Okay, like when you're sitting down to start your homework. Yeah, you just get a good cry out, cleanse the soul. Is finishing in a good, uh, reasonable amount of time, like the limit? Or, it could. Or I propose also at the very, very end, like if you're actually finish it, you then you're, it's done. And you're happy. Yeah. That's more of a cleansing cry. Oh, yeah. I'll take it. Why? 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 Why?